Yes, sir. Here we are for another episode yes, of sir. the Blue Bloods College Game Time Podcast. It's your boy, Trey Smith. It's your boy, Brandon Holmes. Welcome to Blue Bloods College Game Time Podcast, a podcast for the fans, by the fans. Trey, we are at the cha- it's championship. We're running a championship week, man. It's championship weekend. Here we go. Crazy. But you know what, B. Holmes? Before we even get to any of that, I think that you deserve an mm. open mic. Okay. Vent session, get uh, whatever you need to say, whatever you need to get off your chest. I think you have the floor. The microphone is yours. We've got plenty of content to get into this episode, but right now, it's all about you, B. Holmes. All right, man. Well, first and foremost, man, this has been the best weekend of my life. <laughs> 2021 has truly been my year. Thursday was Thanksgiving. I made some fire mac and cheese. Had to hold it down, show them that I could throw it down in the kitchen. Friday, Friday, man, I took the biggest step of my adult life. Got engaged to my girlfriend, Jessica. Woo! Man, that was did the whole thing. Captiva Island, if you haven't been, guys, you should go. It's beautiful. Drove out to Captiva, uh, proposed on the beach. Our family was there. We did it on the beach where we had our first date. Um, super romantic. You know, when you go into those things, man, you think you have everything mapped out, but then you get there and then you Mm. realize you just fumble over all your words, which is very weird for me because I speak on stage so much that I'm often like never, you know, you get, you're always nervous on stage, but to the point where I was just like, oh, I got this. And then I get there (laughs) and I'm like, uh, 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 I'm walking on, I've looked at the video. You could tell I'm like so uncomfortable trying to figure this out. (laughs) But at the end of the day, man, she said yes. So I'm super excited about that, man. It's a blessing. Um, getting engaged. I, I gained a bonus daughter in that, and man, I'm excited to start that chapter of my life. I'm super excited about that. And then we go into Saturday. Yes. And man, oh man, I, I, you know, this is this is just this is how I need to kick off this session so people understand how it is. <laughs> uh, 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 uh. Hell, hell to Michigan. There's invest hell to the victors, valiant hell to the concrete heroes, hell, hell to Michigan, the champions of the way. Go blue! Yes, Go freaking sir. blue! The North remembers. The North, I'm so hot in my mic, I turned it out, but I, man, listen. <laughs> I'm a 32-year-old grown man, y'all. I shed tears of joy. Tears of joy. Follow me on Twitter, Real B. Holmes. Follow me on Instagram, Brandon L. Holmes. I'm post. I- I'm not ashamed because this has been 10 years of heartbreak, 10 years of sometimes being close and just not close enough, 10 years of listening to Ohio State fans just dog mm. us out. And then mm. go on to do great things and win national championships. And you know what, bro? I put this on wax, though. I said this early, early on. That this is what I said. I don't think anybody remembers, but I remember. I said, this is going to be interesting for Ryan Day because this is the first year this is all his people. This mm-hmm. is no longer any remnants of Urban. The only two guys that played, I believe, that came from Urban were Chris Alave, who's the Potential, he's going to be a first-round draft pick this year. And then they had, like, mm-hmm. a backup who didn't get a lot of playing time. Um, this was his first year of only guys. Now, I'm not knocking his recruiting, man. The receivers they have out there, Garrett Wilson's going to be a first-round guy. Alave is going to be a first-round guy. Jackson Smith and Nigba is going to be a first-round guy. He has Marvin Harrison Jr. Um, riding the bench. He has Julian Fleming, who's the number one receiver. Great. And But I, but I, I will say this, though. Ryan Day... I think he would have um I think he would have lost two years ago, but he got lucky because of he brought in Justin Fields. Mm-hmm. You got arguably one of the greatest quarterbacks that was in his class. I think he was like the number two quarterback in his class. Came in and saved because you really would have had to roll with Tate Martell. And now he was smart enough to go get Justin. Justin wanted to leave Georgia. And if you look back at those teams. Justin Fields carried those guys. You got me? He carried mm-hmm. them, and then he had elite talent. I mean, Justin turned out to be a first-round quarterback, right? But this is no. what I came to say, man. I am so proud of my team. I'm so proud of Harbaugh. 
And I, he has not been beneath criticism for me. The team has not been beneath criticism for me. But this is why I respect Harbaugh in this moment, Trey. He went back, and I think you tweeted this. He went back to his bread and butter. He said, yes. okay, like, first off, I applaud him for his humility to say, I have failed and not have lived up to the expectation of my contract. So yes. I'm going to restructure it, take less money to prove why I deserve the money that I was getting. I'm going to be humble right. enough to throw away a staff that I handcrafted and go get younger, right? And understand I need to change as a leader. And then three, mm. I, I honor Harbo for saying at the end of the day, if I'm going to lose, if they're going to run me out of Ann Arbor, I'm going to lose my way. We're going to get back to running the stinking football down your throat. I want to run the football 30, 40 times a game. And dare I say, man, Michigan is clicking at the right time. The, I have not seen somebody get bullied like that in a mm. very, very, very long time. I haven't seen Michigan do that to yes. somebody in a very – I mean, if you look – and I went back and watched the game this morning again because I just had to. I had to just live in my moment of glory. From that first drive – you could tell if Michigan sticks to the run, it's going to be a very long day for Ohio State's defense. I mean, it was bad. It was bad. But then, so shout out to Hassan Haskins, man. A fifty, I think he's a fourth year guy. Fourth yes. year guy. He's going to go to yes. the league this year. Um, five touchdowns. Five touchdowns. Like five touchdowns. Mm. He deserves it. But man, I want to show love um, also to Kay McNamara. It says a lot because, you know, his backup is a five-star quarterback in J.J. McCarthy, and I love J.J. And all season, people have been coming for Cade. But the type of leader that he is to be able to say, okay, I'm going to – I know I'm splitting roles here, so it's kind of like the Tom Brady-Drew Henson deal. Um, not complain about it, and I'm still going to perform, even though people are kind of clamoring for this kid who definitely has a higher ceiling than me, right? But I believe J.J. showed – I mean, I believe Cade showed why he's the starting quarterback in that game. After that interception, mm -hmm. to be cool – Call, collect it, to bring it back. But the guy I want to honor most, man, is my boy Aiden Hutchinson. The dude had a first-round grade at the end of last season and said, I'm going to come back, and I'm going to do what hasn't been done. And I've heard other guys say that. They come back for the fifth year. I don't know if right. they really – if they had an option to really – Aiden really could have just left. He had just hurt his ankle. He was out for the year. He could have said, I'm going to focus on the NFL draft. I'm a pretty much guaranteed first-round draft pick. He went from maybe a back-of-the-end first-round, top-of-the-second-round guy to a bona fide top, possibly three pick. Like, mm. I know everybody likes Thibodeau out of Oregon. Everyone likes to. If I have to go, I haven't seen enough of Thibodeau, though. If, and this is yeah, not for Michigan bias. If I have to choose between – he's been hurt. If I have to choose between the two, I'm going Aiden because Aiden – He's, he can play outside backer. He proved that this year. Shout out to Mike McDonough for showing him he could do that. He could put his hand in the dirt. He could stand up and rush. He has an arsenal of pass rush moves. The dude has 47 tackles, 12, 12 13 sacks, two pass deflections, three forced fumbles. I mean, the dude's a monster. And what I love more about him than – besides just playing the field, he's the heartbeat of this Michigan football team. He is the heart – after they lost Michigan State – he came back and said, well, this isn't happening again. Somebody has to pay for this. And you can tell that team feeds off of him. As he goes, they go. And so, man, I'm so pumped. And I know a lot of people, were, Michigan State fans were tweeting me yesterday, like, oh, well, we be – I don't care. I don't care. You guys are going to, like, the freaking Alamo Bowl. I don't know where you're going. The, you might go to the Outback Bowl. We don't care. And here's what I will say. We play in the Big Ten Championship game next week. It's okay. I'm being honest here, Trey. I don't care if we win that game. I really don't. <laughs> I don't care. I'm so happy we beat Ohio State. It does not matter to me. Like, everyone's going to say, what if you get upset about Iowa? I'm going to talk so bad about you. You think Michigan fans care? Grown men mm. were crying yesterday because of this win. We don't care. We just want to beat Ohio State. That's the game that matters to us. Now, I do think, and we're going to get into this later, I do think if they perform how they performed yesterday, which was darn near picture perfect. The defense, and defense nowadays in college football, it's very, Georgia's the only team I've seen in a long time that's just to shut out defense in college football. Most of the defense now is bend, don't break. I believe this Michigan football team, if they play like they played yesterday, I don't really see 
the only team I see that I'm really nervous about playing is Georgia. Mm. Is Georgia. And it's because we're practically identical. We both want to run the football down your throat. We both want to play stingy defense. They just have a better defense than we do. Um, and we both like to exploit the tight end game. Outside of that, I, I like my odds of seeing this, of my Michigan team hanging with anybody in the country, hanging with anybody. And this is the thing I said, and I said it, I posted it on our YouTube. This is why we play the game, though, because everybody went into this game saying Ohio State was going to run us out the gym. They have three receivers who are going to eclipse a thousand yards. They have a re- they're Trevion Henderson. He doesn't get talked about as much. He broke Maurice Claret's freshman rushing record, eighteen mm-hmm. total touchdowns. C.J. Stroud just put up, I think, it has like over three thousand. We weren't supposed to beat them, but we didn't just beat them. We handled them. So, and I mean, yes, they scored, and they, the way they scored, five stars had the five stars. So that's fine. I just want to say, man, this is the best weekend of my life. I don't know how much better this can get. Maybe outside of my wedding day, I think that's probably going to be better. But outside of here, man, like this is it. It's the best day. So I'm done. I've said all I had to say. I've I've called. I've done FaceTimes. I've tweeted. I'm, I'm going to watch the game again tonight because I'm that excited about it. And, um, man, go blue. Like that, that's all I have. So I'm done, man. I, you, you can take it away from here. Well, I think that um... – I was just looking. I think it was in our second episode that we recorded on September 6th when you talked about Ryan Day having his own players and you predicted, you said he will lose a conference game this year. And I was like, you want to go ahead and double down on that and say it's going to be Michigan? I can't remember how it went from there, but I just looked at September 6th. Not quite. Because, Because then the next week was when they lost to Oregon. And I was like, well... Uh, one domino already fell, mm-hmm. and I remember because I had asked you on the next episode, do you still think they drop a conference game? You're like, oh, yeah, I think they do. Um, well, there's B. Holmes' weekend review. We're going to keep it moving now. Uh, I've got a little quick segment for everyone. We're going to call the Blue Bloods Double Dribble. I just want to give a quick college hoops update. Obviously, uh, as we uh, kind of get into the next couple of months and transition out of football season and out of bowl season, we'll get into more college hoops content that'll be more of the bulk of what we're discussing but i got to go over uh just a couple highlights over the thanksgiving week there were a lot of holiday tournaments that were happening a lot of top five matchups that were happening and uh the first one that happened early in the week was gonzaga number one absolutely destroyed ucla who was number two and it's funny because after that game i tweeted that gonzaga is the new duke And, and, and essentially what i was saying is They remind me and sort of resemble the Duke teams that I grew up on, that like mine and your generation, B. Holmes, grew up on. Timmy puts off serious Christian Leitner vibes and just how they're built. Whereas to me, Duke nowadays is more kind of like built like a Kentucky, kind of the John Calipari, just because they can. I mean, they they had two top five uh, picks on their team, just a few – a few years ago and they don't kind of play the ago. same style even i mean you'll see duke drop back into a two three zone now uh, especially like when they had bagley yep. in the middle of it like the duke teams i grew up on you would never see that i mean it was we're all slapped oh, no. i mean it's, it was gonzaga so anyways now minus it's it's gonzaga is duke minus the championship so they they they, they <laughs> right. need to uh they need to win a few over the next decade to really take on that mantle and that's not taking away from what Duke is. Duke is still the elite right. premier uh, team of all teams in, in the country. So don't, I'm not saying they've replaced Duke. I'm just saying how they're built, kind of their image, so to speak, reminds yes. me of those Duke teams I grew up on. Anyways, I say all that to say I put this tweet out. And then Duke, I think on Friday night, who's number five, beats Gonzaga. And, um, anyways, so then I responded. Ooh, I was like, well, I guess game. Duke read my tweet. Uh, and yeah, that was like a three-point game. <laughs> Crazy. Uh, then we had number four, Kansas, lost to Dayton on like just a prayer. It was crazy because I think they thought yeah. they won the possession. They had the block. The guy penetrated. They got the block. And it went to mm-hmm. Dayton, got the offensive rebound, just threw up a prayer and uh, it went in uh, as the buzzer went off, and, and they, they upset Kansas. And then Rick Patino, Coach Rick Patino, on, the Rick. Hall of Fame coach, 
won a national championship at Kentucky, won a national championship at Louisville, spent some time in the NBA, took Providence to the Final Four. Like, Rick Patino is college Rick. basketball. Had a lot of stuff come out about his time at Louisville. I'm not going to get into all that, yep. but obviously he uh, stepped away from the game. He went and coached overseas. And then last year he took over the Iona Gales. Okay, I think they're – are they up there in Jersey, B. Holmes, or New York, somewhere up there on the East Coast? Um, they might be. Like anyways, that. they uh, – uh, he, he's, he took them over, I think, last year, got them in the tournament. Yeah, New York and City. Then, uh, and then – and then yeah, okay, so New York City. And then this past mm -hmm. week gets a big-time top-10 upset over the Alabama Crimson Tide. And so – and then it looks like they uh, just lost on Sunday to Kansas. But he's he certainly got the eye on the Gales moving in the right direction. I wonder if he's going to end up getting another big-time job or if the the stains of kind of what happened when he left Louisville will be too, too much for him to get another big-time job. But we'll just have to wait and see on that. And then my last thing, yeah. uh, probably the most legendary coach, just basketball coaches, one of the most of all time. Coach Larry Brown played in three Final Fours. I'm sorry, coached in three Final Fours, coached in three NBA Finals, won an NBA championship uh, with the uh, Pistons. Uh, Detroit uh, the, 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 the Bad Boys uh, 2.0. And then won an NCAA championship at Kansas uh, with Danny Manning as his uh, star player. Mm -hmm. He is back in the game now as an assistant coach for Penny Hardaway over at Memphis. And uh, yeah, they... We're a top 10 team, ranked number nine, and they lost. They were upset by Iowa State, I think, on Saturday. So that's my Saturday, quick Blue Bloods double dribble. That's just a preview. We will uh, we will, we will, get much heavier into our College Hoops content as the podcast continues to move forward and we get out of uh, football season. But back to football, B. Holmes. Let's start here. Yes, sir. Okay, we're going to switch up our format just a little bit because the regular season is over. We got championship weekend just ahead of us. So let's start with the coaching carousel. We had some breaking news on Sunday regarding that Florida job. Sunday, baby. Tell us about it. Man, well, on Sunday, man, we found out Billy Napier, man, this official Billy Napier is headed to Gainesville. Headed to Gainesville. He's going to be the new head coach at the University of Florida. Actually, I think I said that. I said that when we did our, our coaching carousel. I did. Yep. I said Billy Napier to Florida. You actually said Hugh Freeze. Um, but I, I just like I just missed upon, <clears throat> and this is why I said Napier. I didn't think there was there's not a lot of hot names. I think of young up and coming names. Everyone's trying to like find the guy who's already established. So I thought as a mm -hmm. hot young up and coming guy, I think Florida's kind of tried to go to the established route. I think it just kind of made the most sense, especially with like certain pieces. I think you're about to touch on this weren't exactly shifting from their current. Uh, institution that it was like okay let's get the hot young guy um the buyout if it doesn't work isn't going to be as bad um and, and he has something to prove oh well you, you're right I did say Hugh Freeze to Florida and just I went through a whole basically Trey Smith coaching carousel and pretty much every coach that I listed off signed an extension this week this past week uh mel tucker signed extended. his extension with michigan state hugh free signs extension with liberty uh james franklin signs his extension with penn state those are the top three but hey be Holmes, there is one coach uh that i put in my carousel mm -hmm. who has not signed his extension yet and that is coach lane kiffin so i'm still keeping an eye on that one um yeah now definitely. a job that he has been associated with that I'm still not seeing it, but a job he's been associated with is that LSU job. But a lot yep. of smoke started surfacing on Saturday night or Saturday during the day, even around Lincoln Riley in LSU kind of already having a verbal agreement and that they were supposed to meet on Sunday, depending on how that Bedlam game went to finalize everything. Mm -hmm. And then Lincoln Riley said Saturday night right after the game that I'm not going to be LSU's next coach. But I saw on Sunday morning that not only is there still some, some smoke there with him potentially going to LSU, but that USC is also getting involved. So that's two heavy hitters mm. that it sounds like are about to get into a bidding war. I saw a number as high as twelve million per year. Um, Goodness gracious! And I want to say that was coming from LSU's camp, 
but again, this is all rumors. This is all just random reports. Now, these were from guys like media guys who are usually right or usually in the in 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 a in a uh, mm -hmm. in the ballpark when know. it comes to these things. It's not just random, you know, Trey Smiths of the world tweeting whatever. Uh, it's actually people who probably have 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 sources on all this. So here's the question I have for you, B Holmes. Right. Um, to kind of wrap up our coaching carousel here. If Lincoln Riley gets poached to either LSU or USC and that OU job comes open, do they pick up the phone and call a guy like Luke Fickle? And then if so, does Luke Fickle answer that call? And if Fickle isn't the answer, where does OU turn to? I think this is like... If I'm OU, I'm doing everything in my power to keep Lincoln Riley because I don't, you know, there's no hot coaching candidate, I think, outside of Luke Fickle. Um, so I think if they if they lose Riley, I think the first person you call is Fickle. Um, Fickle has proven he can, I mean, you know, he he's, he's from that trestle tree, so he can handle a big-time program. And what mm -hmm. he's done at Cincinnati has been nothing short of amazing. Um, and then I think – you know, with OU, you get a national brand, which Luke, so people have to remember, Fickle isn't, he's never not recruited at a big-time program. He comes from Ohio State, so right. he knows how to go get big-time guys. Like, he's not, I don't think, I think people are under-evaluating how great of a recruiter Fickle really is. I think at one point when he was at Ohio State, he was one of the top recruiters in the country um, mm. as far as assistance goes. So with the OU brand, you know, that's already going to get you in a lot of doors. With the success they've had, that's going to get you in a lot of doors. Then, you know, Fickle, proven to be a winner, I think it's going to be a winner. I think that's going to get you in some doors. And I, I see why he, why not. OU's getting ready to go to the SEC. So a lot of guys are going to want that job because you're in the quote-unquote premier football conference in the country. Um, I, and, I, and I'll say as a Big Ten guy, SEC is the best football conference in the country, I believe. Um, I think Fickle does take it. Now, if Fickle, for some odd reason, doesn't take it, there's not like a lot of guys, I think, because you got to know coming into Norman, right. you come with huge expectations. Like right. you, yep. you, you, you have to win. It, it, it's like it's like coaching at BAM. It's like coaching at Ohio State. It's like coaching at Michigan. Like there's expectations to win, and because OU has been winning recently, I don't really know who you call. Now, if I if he doesn't go that way, people might not agree with me with this, but this is who I would call. I would call Dave Aranda from Baylor. He mm. understands the SEC landscape. He's a young, hot guy, a young, hot coaching ticket that's proven, you know. Now, people might say, oh, he's one of the Matt Rule's guys. Man, that guy's winning at Baylor. He's winning. He, what, okay. he was in D.C., I believe? Go at ahead. LSU? Yeah, he was, yeah, in, he DC was in D.C. at LSU, LSU. And now he's about to play for a Big 12 championship in year two at Baylor, which we'll get to in a second. But you know right. who I'm picking up the phone and calling, B. Holmes, if it's not Fickle? Um is actually someone you mentioned that if Kiffin leaves Ole Miss, that Ole Miss should call, that I said I didn't think would be a big enough splash hire for them just based on kind of Stoops, the Hugh Freeze, the Lane Kiffin, and that's Mark Stoops. Yeah. And I know that's kind of cliche that because be of the cool. whole Stoops thing. But then I also wonder this. Do they pick up the phone and call Brent Venables at Clemson? He was a longtime defensive coordinator there. Longtime assistant, a Stoops guy. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I think those are – I think Venables, Mark Stoops, Fickle have to be like the first three calls for that job. Stoops, there's that name piece there. Yeah. But then you look at what he's done at Kentucky – but what all three of those guys will do is they'll come in and build the defense. And if you look at when OU right, won right, their right. national championship, granted it was a totally different era of football, but they had this, this, this up-and-comer, Bob Stoops as their head coach, who was a big-time defensive coordinator at Florida, right. won a national championship as the coordinator there, even though obviously that was like the spurrier years where their offenses were scoring like a million points every week, but he comes in right, and right. got the OU defense right. And that's when they won their national championship. And then obviously over the years, as they continued to 
you know, run their spread offense and their air raid type type stuff with Sam Bradford and all that. But those teams that their best teams always played really good defense. And that's kind of been the knock right. on on Riley is, yeah, he'll he'll outscore everybody in the Big 12, but then he gets into the CFP and he runs into Clemson when they were in those years or he runs into an SEC team and just completely gets shut down and then can't stop anyone. So I, I would think that um, would, would, would be the, the, the first three calls OU would make if, um, if that job were to come open. And I also think that Aranda, to your point, would be a great fit as well. Um, it's gonna hire. It just kind of depends on – I mean, all of them are defensive guys. I guess that's the common denominator in these, these candidates we're throwing around. Yeah. Well, with all that being said, let's get into championship weekend, okay? Um, let's go. Championship weekend. That's we'll, a big one. We'll, yeah. And, and let's talk about these in an order where it's not really – the order that the games are being played, but what I would say are the order of significance of the games being played. And the first two I have for us to talk about are the SEC championship and the Big Ten championship. So let's start with the SEC, yes, okay? Sir. We've got Georgia and Bama set to play on Saturday, three o'clock Central Time, CBS, Mercedes Benz Stadium. <clears throat> Does Alabama – it's crazy that I'm saying this. Does Alabama have a chance against this Georgia team? I think anybody has a chance on any given Sunday. I mean, Saturday, excuse me. Um, shout out Jamie Foxx. Um, I think, Willie Beeman. Uh, Willie Beeman. I, here's the thing that throws me off about Bama, Trey, is on one weekend they can look like the Bama of old. They can look like, man, they're about to run you out of the gym. But then on another week, man, you get the Bama we've seen over the line, like Arkansas, you guys took them to the wire. The upset you called all year, Auburn took them to the wire. Um, I just, you know, I got to go off the fruit you're giving me. And the fruit that's been given to me is Georgia's unbeatable. Like, no one can beat Georgia. The defense is stingy. The offense is sneaky, sneaky explosive. I've watched Georgia enough times, like, you think you're like, oh, man, it's 7-7. Seven, seven. And next thing you know, you look up and it's like 35-7. You're like, what happened? I turned the channel for like 10 minutes. <laughs> and Georgia's off to the races. I, I just have to go off what I've been seeing all year. I don't think I don't think anybody can beat Georgia this year. You tweeted it. This might be the best college football defense we've seen, even better than, uh, I think you said, the 01 Miami Hurricanes. Mm -hmm. um, they, they're, they're unreal. Um the only thing that keeps them in the game is Bryce Young. The kid is unreal at quarterback, man. Um, if he can make some plays, and he's shown he doesn't get flustered. He doesn't get under duress too easily. So I, I, I like Georgia in this game based upon the Georgia I've seen all year. But this is also kind of a rivalry game of some sorts um, because mm -hmm. they, play each, they played each other so much. I, I, I don't see anybody beating – I don't see anybody beating Georgia – uh, I actually want Georgia to lose because now the SEC can't sneak two teams into the playoff because you know if Bama wins, that's going to happen. Oh, no doubt. So I, I, I like Georgia in this matchup. Okay, so I like Georgia in this matchup as well. Obviously, Bama has a chance because they have Nick Saban and they're Bama. So here's what I've been mulling over <laughs> mm -hmm. since Saturday. I watched Alabama play pretty intently for two straight weeks. Okay. I watched them play against Arkansas and I watched them in that iron bowl. They cannot protect Bryce young. They couldn't protect him yeah. against Arkansas. It's just, that's true. Our Arkansas kind of got cut up on the back end and Bryce young was able to do what you said, made plays. Same thing he did yesterday against Auburn. He made plays. But there were a lot of times where Arkansas would rush three and drop eight and still got pressure. Every time they blitzed, they mm -hmm. got pressure. Now, Bryce Young was still able to beat them at times, but they sacked him. I was going to try and pull up the stats, but right, he, right. they sacked him, I think, like five times. Arkansas did. And then Auburn, I don't know how many sacks that was, but watching the game, it felt like they were in his face all game. And so I'm going, how in the world 
If this offensive yeah. line can't protect against Arkansas and Auburn, how are they going to protect against the greatest front seven I've ever seen in college football? How? How are they going to do that? So then I start thinking, okay, what does Bama's offensive game plan have to be to give themselves a chance to win? Right. And B. Holmes, here's what I'm going to throw out there. I'm no football genius. I never claim to be, never will claim to be. But just thinking this through, I think you ditch the RPO. Kirby Smart, to me, doesn't get enough credit for how innovative he's been at defending the RPO since that's kind of really become the new hit thing. Um, I'm not talking about just this year. I'm talking about like several years ago when the whole RPO like craze, it became the big buzzword in all of football and every team started running it. His Georgia teams, if you go look historically, have always defended the RPO well. Now, a big part of it is because what he asks his guys to do, he recruits the guys that can do it. So don't get me wrong. It's kind of like running a a certain press in basketball. Like if I had a dude I could put back here and play center field and then just face guard everybody, you dang right, that's what I'm going to do. Like like what he asked the guys to do is extremely difficult to do, but he he recruits the players that can do it. So before I sound off on any of that, I wonder if Bama kind of ditches the RPO and runs more sprint out type plays with Bryce Young, Mm. who, who, who does have legs don't get me wrong i'm not saying he's lamar jackson but he does have legs and he can throw on the run but let's get that big old boy in the middle moving laterally let me let me spend my whole first half running sprint out plays to the left and right and i'm getting that front for georgia moving laterally for a whole half of football i'm trying to take away their legs i'm trying to gas them out to where then Mm-hmm. In the second half, I can get back to playing my Bama brand of football, not because my guy's right. better than your guys, but because my guy is not as fatigued as your guy. And so I'm just curious if right. maybe that's that's an approach that could be effective against this defense, because I'm sitting here going, they're not going to block them. Like they, I mean, I no. guess you max, I just, I just don't see it happening. And But I know Bryce Young, like you said, he's a playmaker. He's a gamer. He can throw on the run, as he's shown the last two weeks when he's running for his life. So how about instead of having him run this RPO that kind of delays things and gives time for everything to break down, let's just sprint him out. Let's make these guys run sideline to sideline for a whole half of football. So I don't know. We'll see what happens. I still think Georgia wins by multiple possessions, uh, mind you. I just, I I don't think that, you know, for the first time and, in a hey, long la- time, la- go ahead. No, last thing on that is we got to remember the biggest X factor for Bama. They're coached by arguably the greatest football mind in college football history. In yes. Nick Saban. If there's anybody who can out, like I'm saying, like once you start talking sideline to sideline, I was already thinking that in my head. If there's anybody who can out, who can scheme his team into a win, it's Nick Saban. Yes. I don't think it'll happen, but I think it's going to be a way closer game, and I think he's going to give his team a fighting chance in the end. And this is the one thing I'll say, and then we can move on. Um, This is where this comes into an advantage. Georgia has not played a close game all year. Every game has been a blowout. Bama has played consistently, has played a few tight games in the end. And we have to know when you've done it, it's all about momentum. It's all about comfortability. When you've played some tight games and you've come on the other side of those victories in those tight games, you feel a little bit more comfortable when the tight moment comes because you've done it before. So mm-hmm. that that's be my only caveat. I think Saban can scheme them into a possible win. And if the game is tight, Bryce Young has proven he has the cojones to will that team through. He's a gamer enough to say, put the ball in my hands, one last possession, I can make some magic happen. And I do think Georgia will win, but it would not shock me if they didn't. I'll just put it like that. It would mm. not shock me. It would shock me. <laughs> the guy <laughs> who spent the first 10 weeks of the season screaming, you're not beating Bama. I just, Georgia has 
obviously made a strong impression on me coming from a very objective standpoint that defense yeah. they're, and, and, and they're not getting near the press coverage like the the media coverage I feel like they should be getting now don't get me wrong it's not like they're underrated they're number one everyone agrees they're the best team in the country I just the the job that defense the way that defense has played all year, they haven't given up more than 17 points in a single game. And that was one game. They gave up mm-hmm. 17. Most of their games, it's either 0, 3, 10, 13. I mean, they, they, you rarely get more than one touchdown on that team if you even get one at all. Okay, let's get to the Big Ten Championship, uh, B, because I know this is, uh, this is the one you're going to be mostly locked in on. Okay. I'm sorry. I know there's a pause, but Trey, I just sent you a text. They I'm just reading it right now. Lincoln Riley just, I'm sorry. Luke, hey, this is how, we're not cutting this out. This is real life. We just received a text that Lincoln Riley is telling the Sooners he's leaving to become the head coach at USC. Oh, my gosh. Oh, and ESPN broke it. Well, there you go. So, I'm, there you hey. go. Well, we just we just covered that for you. So go ahead and press rewind and listen to our little spiel again about OU if you need to, because now it's official. It's official, like, which I think, <clears throat> and I know we, we got other things to get through, but I wanted to say this when we talked about it, but I wanted to get to the episode because we like to keep them around 45 minutes. Great hire by USC. Now those guys like Bryce Young, those guys like CJ Stroud, who have been yes. going across the country, they now stay in Southern Cal. Those guys like JT, Dan, like they don't, that's been USC's biggest thing. They normally not lose their golden boy quarterbacks to other programs. Now those guys stay, they stay in California. Oh, our, our boy texted us yesterday. Our, our, our boy, uh, Corey, shout out to Corey. He hit us up uh, about Bryce Young talking about, you know, I don't yep. remember what he said, the LA kid or the <clears throat> California kid. Uh, yeah doing work and i said my response was well if pete carroll's still the coach at usc he's not playing for alabama right now um no way or something to that effect and yeah to your point lincoln riley is especially from the quarterback perspective and let me just this is a perfect segue into big 10 championship because one of the things i was going to say about michigan that i think gave them an advantage against ohio state that they're not going to have in this championship game was the weather. Think about that Ohio State team. They got Texas boys at receiver. They got a California kid (laughs) at quarterback. I mean, yes. CJ Stroud's probably never seen snow in his life. The Texas kids (laughs) have seen snow, but when it snows, you don't leave the house. School gets canceled. Practice is shut down or you're in the indoor. I mean, I really believe that that significantly oh, played in Michigan's favor because Ohio state, I know you already talked about this. They quit in that game. Yeah. They quit oh, yeah. that last touchdown Michigan scored. There was no resistance. They threw in the towel. So I'm wondering now in a neutral setting in a domed arena, cause it's at Lucas oil, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, at Lucas oil. Lucas Oil, two teams who have very similar styles of play. What happens? Um, I'm still going to pick Michigan to win. Mm-hmm. But I think this is going to be a close game. I don't think Iowa's going to go away quietly. And I think on some level, not saying this is smart of them, I think on some level Iowa is – saying their prayers, thanking the Lord that they're not playing Ohio State. I think they're excited about the matchup they just got. It's a better matchup in their defense um, to what they want to do. This is why, I mean, it's Iowa, and weird things always happen to Iowa. But let me just kind of give you a reason why I'm not too afraid. Last game alone, their starting quarterback, Spencer Petras, man, he only threw for 102 yards. He only mm. threw for 102 yards. Um, Tyler Goodson is their running back. He's their playmaker. I believe, you know, I, I, it goes back to the 
and they don't really have a, a strong guy on the outside. Like their leading receiver is a tight end who's Sam Laporta, who has 486 receiving yards. Now people are going to say Cornelius Johnson for us only has 586, but we know at Michigan, we have so many weapons. You got Cornelius on the outside. You got A.J. Henning, who you have to get the ball in the end of rounds. Donovan Edwards, the five-star true freshman running back. He st- I mean, he went 10 yards, 110 receptions, 178 yards against Maryland. Who's the you one that Blake lit Horn. up Michigan got- State? <clears throat> has- the freshman. Um, the, receiver, the receiver, I think. <clears throat> yes. <clears throat> Number one, maybe? Oh, Andre, Andrew Anthony. You have Andrew, yeah, Andrew Anthony. You have him out there. Then you have Blake Corum. Then you have Hassan Haskins. So we don't have like this one guy who's just like the guy who would have been for us, Ronnie Bell, who got hurt for the first game of the year. But right. Michigan just has too many weapons, man. We have too many, like, and, and I think it would be maybe a close first half because I, well, it all comes down to this, man, and I know it's easy to say this, but it comes down to trench play, man. If we can do what we did against Ohio State, Ohio State yesterday, and just slam the ball down their throats, it's not going to be much of a game. It's not going to be mm. much of a game at all because that's Jim Harbaugh's thing, and the complexity of how he ran the football yesterday was amazing. And Josh Gaddis, and I have been a big Josh Gaddis kind of critiquer, was has been in his bag. The last couple of weeks, I mean, yeah. has been the Statue of Liberty uh, end around the, for the first touchdown against Ohio. I mean, and then this is what I will say, because the Michigan teams of former would have just tried to run the clock out. Gaddis went for the kill yesterday. Like, I mm. feel like on every drive, he was not calling conservative. I, I remember when we, we did the three and out out of, out of halftime, we run a flea flicker like they were going to kill. And I feel like this team's kind of found that killer instinct. Because we didn't do it at Michigan State, we let them hang around. They're going for, like, let's kill – good teams kill teams now. And so I think it might be close in the first half because Iowa's defense is stingy. At one point, they were leading the country in interceptions. I believe by the time they played Penn State, they had already had, like, 10 interceptions on the year. Um, mm. So they have a stingy back half. But I will say this. It's going to be tough for them if your defense is on the field all the time. I mean, we saw what happened to Ohio State yesterday. If Michigan gets that run game rolling – you're just you better strap in. It's going to be a long day for you because Hassan Haskins is going to brutally run through you. And then once you think you've had enough of that, they'll put in Blake Corum. Then they'll put in Donovan Edwards. Then they'll give the ball to AJ Henning. And then maybe Roman Wilson beats you over the top. And then maybe Andre Anthony gets you on a fly run. Like Michigan really does have too many weapons. So I, I don't mm. think it'll be a close game. I think maybe they thought, yeah, this was better because you don't have to deal with the spread offense, but I believe Michigan's run game is so it's unique enough. And those boys are feeding off that momentum and they just saw what it was like to dominate a team. And they've been dominating all year. Eh, I, I think dare I say, this is maybe like a 35, 14 kind of game. Yeah. I was definitely not going to out Michigan, Michigan this year. Um, all right, let's get to the big 12 championship. We've got Oklahoma state versus Baylor. That's going to be that noon slot or 11 a.m. if you're on the central time zone. Uh, it's going to be a good game. At Jerry World, AT&T Stadium. I'm just going to say this. It's extremely difficult to beat a team twice in the same season. Oklahoma State beat Baylor earlier this year. I think that Baylor behind the legs and the arm of Bohannon, their quarterback from Earl, Arkansas, beats them in what will probably be a I don't want to say shootout because both of these teams actually play pretty good defense relative to the Big 12 mm-hmm. um but I could see this being a I guess this would be a shootout 35 31 something like that 38 35 35 31 maybe yeah. 31 28 I think it comes down to a missed field goal or a last field goal or missed extra yep. points. Some, some, something weird like that I think is something going to happen weird. in the game. And I think that Baylor will win that and be the big 12 champions. I like that. I don't really have any other disagreements about that. Honestly. <laughs> okay. So let's go ACC championship. You got Pitt versus wake forest. You've got the, potential first round quarterback over there with Pitt who some are are hyping as a Heisman finalist 
versus Wake Forest and their sort of delay read option offense playing in Charlotte, North Carolina. Mm-hmm. What do you think on that one? Uh, uh, I think if Pitt can come out hot, I think they kind of walk away with it. Um, actually, just like Pitt, man, I've kind of fallen off the Wake Forest train. You know, they've kind of let some teams get back in the game. It's like they're missing that killer instinct. And Pickett has shown. I've watched them play a little bit this year. Pitt has shown they can they can win from behind if they have to. Um, and then once they get rolling, they get rolling. So I, I like Pitt in that game. I I want Wake Forest to win. I like the feel good story of Wake Forest. I think it's good. I think it's great. I like Klaus and their head their head coach, man. I think he's just an awesome guy. Um, but I, I like when it comes to a big games like this, often do come down to quarterback play, and I think Pickett's the better between him and Hartman. So I like Pitt to win, but I'm rooting for the Demon Deacons down there um, in Wake Forest. I mean, I think you said it exactly. It, when you have an evenly matchup or, or as, as, I guess, tight of a matchup as this could potentially be, I'm always going to give the nod to the quarterback. And I, I, I think Pitt pulls yeah. this one out as well. I feel like they're due also. They've just kind of been scratching and sniffing. They couldn't get past Clemson. Mm-hmm. I can't remember if they played them one or two years in the ACC championship. It's like they're always kind of – at the top of their division and then run into a brick wall and wake forest has just kind of come out of nowhere. I think Pitt handles it, even though it is kind of right there in wake Forest's backyard. Okay. The American championship. I am pulling for Houston. Like no other pump for, I want the Cougars to win this game so bad just because Texas it's Houston. I, I they're kind of one of my favorite group of five teams. I like Dana Holgerson. I think he's done a great job at that program. They've got a really good quarterback. I don't think they win the game. I think since he wins it and puts the committee in, basically puts the committee's back against the wall and says, Hey, are you going to put mm-hmm. a G five team in the playoff or not? But I think Houston has a chance to let the committee off the hook and separate from the CFP stuff. I would just like to see Houston win it because it'd be a huge win for their program. And, who knows? It might get them in the New Year six. Yeah, man, I, I'm pulling for Houston. You know, H Town all the way, man. I like what Holmgren is doing down there, man. They got a great group of five team. Here's what I and I was gonna lean that way, but this is why I'm actually kind of pulling for Cincinnati. This is this is my reasoning. Um, it'd be good, like I said, see, hold the hold the committee accountable. Let's 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 put a team in that deserves it. I think Cincinnati is about as good of a group of five team as we've seen in a while. Um, and this is my other thing. They'll probably get the four slot if they go in. I think they get the four slot. So if 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 Georgia handles Bama, Michigan handles Iowa. I think Michigan gets the two nod. I think um, if Oklahoma, let's say if Oklahoma State or whoever, I I think the committee gives the group of five team the four slot. This okay. is why I do want Cincinnati in though. This is why I want Cincinnati in, Trey. Yeah, Cincinnati hold their feet to the fire. Has a yeah, Cincinnati has a bone to pick with Georgia again. Mm. they played them tough last year. Now, I know people look at the score, but if you look at it, they played them tough. And I think, man, I, I don't think they can, but in, the, in in college football where do you believe in miracles and you have the Boise States and all, like anything is, I would like to see Cincinnati try to avenge their loss last year. Um, I would like to see them play. They're, that's a game I will watch. Because then I have to believe at that point, Luke Fickle's, probably the hottest name on the coaching circuit. Let's see what he can do in prime time against the number one team in the country after they've been rooting that they deserve some, they deserve some respect. And would you not, I'm just being honest. I don't think it'll happen, but who would not love to see Cincinnati, the group of five team, the David upset the Goliath that they should not be. Um, I would love to see that happen and then love to see them play Michigan and Michigan get a national title. Like that would just be my dream scenario right there. So I'm rooting for Cincinnati in this. I, I want them because I want them in the college football playoff. I think they deserve it, even though I've kind of hated on them this year. Cause I think it's good to have some parody in our sport. Um, because yeah. as our boy, RJ Young says, why do we play the game if we're not going to honor that? And I would love yeah. to see that being honored. And let the, let's put a group of five team in there and let's, let's see what happens. Well, I, I would certainly watch Cincinnati, Georgia as well. Um, and yeah, I'm always going to pull for the David, but I think that Georgia wins 49, 14, and it's a very boring game. The 14 points come in the fourth (laughs) quarter 
late when Georgia's playing all of their walk-ons. Um, just my thought on that. Okay, Pac-12 True. championship game. You can tell how much we value the Pac-12 championship by the fact that we're talking about it after a group yeah. of five championship game. Probably not going to watch it. Don't care who wins. All I'll say is this. If Oregon has any pride at all, if they really have their head coaches back, who prides himself on toughness and physicality and all of those things, they mm. will come in and dominate Utah from start to finish. They did not even show up for that game a couple weeks ago when Utah put it on them. No. And this is their chance to avenge that loss. They still have something to play for. They're not going to be in the playoff, but they could at least play in the Rose Bowl and avenge right. their coach's dignity because Utah came in and swiped it right out from under them a couple weeks ago. But, I mean, Utah probably has one of the most underrated, underappreciated head coaches in the nation. Uh, is that uh, Kyle mm -hmm. Whittington? And when it, yep. he's just, if you notice, he's always, they're always around. They're always in this Pac-12 championship. So, well, like I said, I think that's the Friday night game. I'm probably going to be at a high school playoff game down here in the great state of I Texas. Oh, Not sure I'll actually watch it, but that's my two cents on that game. Yeah, I don't really. Um, maybe Utah. I think Utah wins. Um, I think somebody needs to call the head coach at Utah and hire him. The dude's done a great job at Utah. Somebody, maybe that's a, that's maybe that's somebody. Oh, you needs to call. Oh, <laughs> you might need to maybe. give him a call. Um, but yeah, I, I think the same. I have an event that night, so I don't plan on watching it. I honestly, don't care. Um, like you said, Oregon wins. Maybe they go to the Rose Bowl, because, but you got to see like Ohio State's probably gonna get the Rose Bowl bid, and I don't think they want to sign up for two teams that's already played each other again. So I'm kind of pulling for Utah. I would like to see Utah versus Ohio State in the Rose Bowl. I think that'd be a good fit. But other than that, I, I'm unbothered by who wins that game, honestly. Yeah, same. Okay, and then we got the rest of the group of five. Conference USA, you got UTSA, who got I'm upset by forward. North Texas on Saturday. I know, um, so they play Western Kentucky. We've got the MAC, the MAC championship, Kent, Kent State and yes. uh, NIU, Northern Illinois. We got the Mountain West, no. Utah State at San Diego State. San Diego State having a heck of a season. Uh, Brady Sun Hope. Belt, yeah, Brady Hoke, that's right, former Michigan guy. Uh, Sun Belt Championship game, App State versus Louisiana. I uh, wonder if Napier will be coaching in that. And then the w only one of these I really care to comment on is the SWAC Championship game. It's Prairie View A&M mm. and Jackson State. We've talked about Jackson State throughout the season. Coach Prime out there, um, who is now 10-1, yes, and one, looking to go 11-1, and one, and then win this to play in the Celebration Bowl. Um I think you mentioned this either last week or the week before how Jackson State, Alcorn State had a bigger draw, had a bigger turnout than the Egg Bowl did mm -hmm. as far as uh, the the uh, crowd uh, attendance. And I just, I'm here for it. I want to see uh, them to continue to do well, both Shiloh and Shador Sanders. Um, he just landed one of the top rated uh, cornerback recruits, uh, Juco, uh, uh, I think last week or earlier this week, I don't remember. Mm -hmm. And I think that, uh, you know, it'll probably be a good game, but I hope Jackson state pulls it out and I'd love to see them finish the season 12 and one with their only loss being a one possession loss to a, a FBS team. So yeah, I'm, I'm pulling for them. That's all I've got for those. The rest of those, I don't. Do you have anything on those last kind of, I guess, five group of no, five? Man. I think we've kind of just swag. talked about the ones that have, that matter most to us. Shout out to Jackson State, man. Um, you know, Coach Prime, man. I want to see him do well. Obviously, he's not going to TCU. They pulled Sunny Dykes, which I actually called, but um, you did, yeah, man. I want to. Yeah, I, I said that. So no, just hey, pulling for them, man. I, I'm just want to see some. Well, I'm rooting for everybody from Texas, UTSA. You know, I want those boys to do what they're doing, man. Keep up the good work. Outside of that, no, man, I'm it. I think um, it's time for us to hit the, the true minute drill, man. True minute drill. Okay, true minute drill this week, B. Holmes, is what is your biggest bracket-busting scenario over championship weekend, right? You talk about March Madness with basketball. You have your bracket mm -hmm. busters, which is when, like, a really high seed gets knocked off in the first round. 
What's your biggest bracket busting scenario as it pertains to the college football playoff that could happen this weekend over championship weekend? So if you've been with us from day one, you know, true minute drill. We start on the whistle, end on the buzzer. Um, I ask this every week. Who, who, do you want to go first or do you want me to go first? That's fine. I can or do go you first. care? Huh? Uh, it doesn't matter. I can go first. It's fine. Okay. Okay. Here we go then. Start on the whistle, end on the buzzer. All right, guys, when it comes to it, man, this will be the biggest bracket buster. I really need Georgia to upset Bama to completely eliminate them from the playoff. Um, then I also would love for Cincinnati to lose to Houston because here's then what we'll see. Well, that'll put Georgia at number one. It'll probably put Michigan at two. And then if Oklahoma State can handle business, you have Notre Dame at three, OSU at four, which – I think would be good. It's good for parity. It's good for college football. I think at this point of the season, we all believe Georgia is the undeniable favorite to win the national championship. But wouldn't it be good for once to not see the typical Georgia, Bama, Ohio State, Clemson? It'll be good to see some teams that you don't normally get to see. But also, you have two blue bloods in there. You'd have a Georgia who's a blue blood. You'd have a Michigan who's a blue blood. And then you got two teams. And then you have Notre Dame. So you still get the blue blood. You still get the TV ratings. But then you have little old Oklahoma State who is shining and proving and kind of shoving it in OU's face that though you're leaving for greener pastures, you still couldn't compete in the conference that you were in because we are representing the Big 12. Um, so the buzzer went. That's all I have to say, but um, that, that would be my biggest bracket, big, ah, biggest bracket buster for this upcoming weekend. Okay, I'm resetting the clock, and I'm starting. Here we go. Start on the whistle, end on the buzzer. I'm going to be honest with you. I don't think there really is a bracket busting scenario. And here's why, because the biggest one I could put together as I'm looking at the lineup of these games, um, you know, obviously you could go Iowa beating Michigan, Baylor beating Oklahoma state and Houston beating Cincinnati. I don't think that that's likely to happen at all. However, <laughs> I think Baylor beating Oklahoma state and then Houston beating Cincinnati all that would do is give the committee exactly what they're wanting, which is the green light to put a two loss Alabama team in the CFP. And I think with any of these potential bracket busting scenarios, you can find that's essentially what it would do. Yeah. It would throw things off, but it would just be a way to get Bama in with two losses with them losing to Georgia. But then if they find a way to beat Georgia, there goes the buzzer. But if they find a way to beat Georgia, now they're really good because then they can just have a one-loss Bama, a one-loss Georgia picking up those two, and then a one-loss Notre Dame. And then now essentially you can just have your other being whichever one of these won, whether that be Michigan, whether that be Cincinnati, whether that be Oklahoma State, whatever. So definitely could be some bracket busting, but I think all bracket busting would do is just get a, a, a two-loss and m uh, sorry, did I say A&M? I said Bama, right? A two-loss Bama team. Yeah. If I no, said Bama. A&M on the true minute drill, my bad. I meant Bama, but hopefully I said Bama. <laughs> Social <laughs> media time. <laughs> Social media. Guys, hey, man, we thank you. Um, yeah, we're back on our YouTube, man. So Blue Blood yes. CDT, Blue Blood's College Game Time, man. We, man. we had a big week, man. So thank you guys who subscribe. If you haven't, please subscribe. It's not just uh, we have videos throughout the week, but also hot takes throughout the week. So make sure you subscribe to that. Follow us on IG and TikTok, Blue Blood CGT. Man, we'd love to have you guys there. Follow us on Twitter if you're watching. You see us below. Um, you can find Trey at It's Trey Smith. You can find yes. me at Real B Holmes on Twitter. It's probably where we get our most engagement, where we like to interact with the fans. Um, and I, I think that's it. Any parting words, man? Well, I was just going to say with YouTube, like we're really, we're really going hard with our YouTube right now. So if you're listening and you're not already subscribed to us, just go to Blue Blood CGT. Uh, that's about to be our official URL because we have surpassed 100 subscribers. We're at, um, yes, I, I think we're at like 101, 103 now. Uh, B. Holmes and I 
have a formula that we're applying and so far knock on wood it's working and we're not gurus we're not media guys like a big part of why we chose to get back to the original lane we were in was because we don't want this to be some you know national industry based type podcast or content like we're fans mm -hmm. we're just like you that's listening to this right now like we are no different from you we are fans yeah. we love to talk college sports we love to talk college football soon you'll see how much we love talking college hoops that's what we want to stick to and through some of our other ventures <laughs> that we've been able to um just kind of <laughs> fall into through the through the course of us doing yeah. this podcast we've learned a template and we've basically taken that template and instead of working ourselves into the grind for someone else's entity, we said, what if we took this template and applied it to what we're trying to build? So if you're, if you're an old school music fan, um, and remember when labels versus independent artists used to be a big deal right. and used to listen to like underground, right. like I used to always listen to Swisha House when I was in, in high school and, 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 and like they loved them, not just because of the chopped and screwed music, which was really big back then, but just because they were an independent, like underground type entity. They weren't signed with some major label. Mm. And so that's kind of the lane we're getting back in. But we're taking all these things that we've learned and we're applying them to building our own following and a couple of our videos have caught quote unquote have caught fire on YouTube. I think one of them's pressing towards 3000 views and it's getting, like we're getting interaction, we're getting engagement, but those of you listening right now, or even if you're watching, like hit subscribe, like, like join us, like we're you, we're not, yeah. we're not trying to be like something bigger than what, or, or think we're something bigger than what we really are. We're two fans. I wear Razorback gear. He wears Michigan gear, but we talk about the national landscape. It's who we are. We would appreciate any support that those of you um, um, have already given, but we'd certainly appreciate a subscribe because I'm just going to put it out there, B. Holmes. Like, our goal is to monetize this thing to where we could do this full time, pump out as much content as possible. We're going to start mm -hmm. doing live stream parties. We're going to start doing watch parties. We're going to start doing site. We're going to games and, and, and doing those. Yeah. But it's brick by brick. It's one brick at a time. And right now, we're just trying to build this thing with the foundation. We stacked a lot of significant bricks over the last week, really. I mean, we've, we've jumped in our YouTube yeah. subscribers <laughs> by like 70, I think, um, just, just over huge. the last several days. And if you're watching right now, hit subscribe. If you're listening right now, go to our YouTube, Blue Blood CGT. Um, we would just appreciate any support. Um, and it's free. <laughs> so It's free. Free content. But we love you guys, man. Thank you guys for always tuning in. For everybody, remember, celebrate your wins, especially my <laughs> Michigan Wolverines fans. We deserve it. Enjoy this week. Buy yourself a drink, a dinner, whatever else you need. And those who lost, soak in your sorrows. Ohio State, I hope this burns you because you haven't beat us in technically 730-some-odd days. Um, and, yeah, sucks to be you guys this weekend. But other than that, soak it, enjoy your victory, soak in your sorrows. And until next week, we love you guys. Peace.